see with the microphone. Good morning. My name is Lee Taylor White. I'm an Idlewild member and member of the MICA core team. I see our shirts. Y'all listen about MICA at the moment for ministry that's in the 10 o'clock service today. Kevin Ritz is a good friend of mine. I'm so excited to introduce him to y'all. He is a lifelong Memphian and public servant. Um, he's a longtime member of Idlewild. Uh, his accolades are very long and distinguished. He has been working for the federal government in the U.S. Attorney's Office for 17 years, round of 18. Um, he, you know, has moved up through the ranks there. Uh, he started clerking for uh, Judge Gibbons, an Idlewild member, um, and then he was nominated to be the U.S. Attorney by President Biden, and we unanimously confirmed. Um, when was that? That was, was it a year ago? Okay. So, yeah. Um, well, what else can I tell y'all about Kevin? There's so much. He's a huge Grizzlies fan. Y'all know Kevin. Y'all know that. Um, and uh, just a good person, good friend, um, you know, servant to the community. Also, um, I asked him jokingly before I was, you know, speaking this morning. I was like, are there any accolades from, you know, like maybe elementary school, anything like that? And he's, uh, he and his sister were both like spelling bee champions multiple years in a row. Um, so I think that probably says something about Kevin's writing abilities as well, you know, and your parents. Yes. And he was co-valedictorian of White Station High. He always went to public school. Um, so, I mean, we couldn't have a better public servant, you know, for the um, Western District of Tennessee. Um, please welcome Kevin Ritz. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, take Lee Taylor to introduce me to other uh, groups as well. Um, Lee Taylor is correct. I, so first of all, yes, it's true. I am the United States attorney, but she's also correct that when I first kind of define myself as someone, okay, tell me about yourself. I usually first say I'm a Memphian and I grew up here. Uh, we moved here when I was three years old. My parents still live um, in East Memphis. In case you're curious, I grew up at Germantown United Methodist Church. We were very active there. My parents still go to Germantown Methodist every Sunday. My mom sings in the choir. Um, and after graduating from White Station, I went away for college and graduate school and law school, and I came back, and I chose to come home, and that was after I graduated law school in May of 2004, almost 20 years ago, um, and I started my legal career here as a law clerk for Judge Julia Gibbons. As um, uh, Lee Taylor said, she uh, uh, gave me the incredible opportunity to clerk for her for a year. It's kind of a one-year Typical federal uh, clerkship is a, uh, is a very common way to start a legal career. It was a blessing for me in so many ways. Um, and it was a, a few years after that that I became a member of Idlewild. I think those two things probably were related, that I worked for Judge Gibbons and I uh, became a uh, member of Idlewild. But I was going to say, I had, actually had it written down, it's not just because Will's here, but you know, those people who aren't lawyers may not really appreciate just how legendary of a career Judge Gibbons has had and just frankly what a legend she is in, in the federal courts. Um, that's frankly a whole nother presentation for another day, uh, but uh, I'm very eternally thankful to her for giving me that opportunity. I chose to stay here, so my clerkship was a one-year thing in the federal building downtown on the ninth floor, and that ended on a Friday in August of 2005, and I started the following Monday in the United States Attorney's Office, which is on the eighth floor, so I moved one floor down. And I've been there for almost 18 years. Um, last summer, I uh, was appointed to, to run the office. So I've been an assistant U.S. attorney and now the U U.S. attorney for about nine months. Um, so all that to say is public service is what, you know, I have devoted my career to. Can you hear okay? Okay, good. Um, and um, I said today that I, and I'm, I'm proud to say that the United States is the only client I've ever had as a lawyer. It's true. And um, I think that's pretty unusual, actually, uh, but it's true. Um, I said I would talk about justice and civil rights because those are things that we work on every day. Um, I do want to have uh, some dialogue, and I've got, got some things that I was going to ask you guys uh, towards the end. But before I talk about those things and kind of talk about how we approach those things, I thought I would just kind of, um, you know, I do this when I, when I speak to some public groups, just talk about kind of where we are in America in 2023 for anyone like me and my team who works on justice, criminal justice, or justice generally, and civil rights, you know, we've had a lot to deal with in the last several years, not just the pandemic that killed more than a million Americans. Uh, we had 
a violent attack perpetrated by fellow citizens on our seat of government. We've had um, an unacceptable increase in gun violence and violent crime. Uh, we've had um, this is not something that maybe comes to the forefront of your mind, but I can tell you that for those of us who worked in the U.S. Attorney's Office and elsewhere in the federal government about four and a half years ago now, we had the longest federal government shutdown in history, five weeks where we didn't get paid, right? And same with our law enforcement partners and all that. Big deal. Um, a long overdue reckoning with the role of racism in the criminal justice system. Uh, just about six months ago now, five months ago, um, a tragic death of Tyree Nichols here in Memphis, uh, which has led to, I think, an even deeper reckoning, both locally and elsewhere. Um, and then finally, just a couple of weeks ago, the first ever federal criminal indictment of a former president. Let me let me be clear. I'm not going to talk about those last two things today. <laughs> OK, you can ask me, but I'm not going to talk about them. Uh, but that's just a lot to navigate, right, for all of us. But for those of us in the types of jobs that we have in the U.S. Attorney's Office. So it's a lot. Um, I've kind of um, structured my presentation in three uh, chunks. Uh, first, I want to just kind of set the scene and tell you who we are and what we do, just kind of be a, a, provide a little more uh, definitional context to what it means to be the U.S. Attorney. Um, and then our priorities, just to provide some more kind of context of just what are we up to these days? What do we spend our time doing in the U.S. Attorney's Office? And then finally, how I approach the responsibility of seeking justice and protecting um, civil rights. So I'll first start with kind of who we are and what we do. Um, the slides are kind of boring, so it's no big deal if you don't see them. I'm, I'm, they, don't, they don't really add anything that, that, you're, that I'm not going to say. But what does it mean to be U.S. Attorney? Basically, I'm the chief federal law enforcement officer in our district, the Western District of Tennessee. Um, and I'm the head lawyer for the United States. So I'm really your lawyer. Um, our mission statement is we uphold the rule of law, we protect civil rights, and we keep Americans safe. Often, that means federal criminal prosecutions. But I, I try to, you know, kind of just set the scene by, by clarifying that I'm not the district attorney. P people get confused about this. <laughs> uh, we were at Playhouse on the Square just two weeks ago. I saw an old neighbor. He came up and he said, how's being the district attorney? How's that going? I said, well, that's Steve Mulroy. That's not me. Um, but you know, some of, some of my best friends from high school don't really, I think, have this clear in their in their brain. Uh, but in any event, what we do is a little different. Uh, there is some overlap, and I'll talk about criminal prosecutions in a second. But we actually handle civil matters for you, for the United States. So the United States is a big employer. We get sued all the time in civil court. So we handle those things too. That's different from the district attorney's office. They just basically do criminal prosecutions. We actually have a fan financial lit litigation unit where we collect debts for the U.S. Treasury. Um, we handle our own appeals. That's something that's also different uh, between my office and Steve Mulroy's office. Uh, but look, we're a big law firm. We're the United States' law firm. We represent the United States in court. And I think we're one of the best law firms in West Tennessee. Uh, 45 lawyers, um, and we cover 22 counties. So it's not just Memphis and Shelby County. I wanted to kind of show the map, just kind of illustrate what we um, cover in the Western District of Tennessee. I've been to many of these, trying to check them off one by one in my tenure. Um, it's basically everything this side of the Tennessee River plus Perry County, which is kind of random. Um, but that's a lot of ground to cover. We can talk more about that. But um, Kind of to, to kind of play out the theme of how what we do is different from state prosecutors to try to illustrate that a bit. You may think of, OK, criminal prosecutors, they do murders, DUIs, assaults, rapes, violent crime. That's those things that I just mentioned are really not us um, with some exceptions. So what is us? Well, anything that you can think of it as anything that crosses state lines or involves interstate um, traffic or an interstate nexus. So if you kidnap someone and take them across state lines, well, that can be a federal crime. Um, carjackings, bank robberies, business robberies, those can all be federal crimes. Why? Banks are insured federally. Businesses do business in interstate commerce. Carjackings, we have to basically prove that the car at some point crossed state lines. Usually we can do that. Um, Aggravated assaults and domestic assaults. So that's, you know, something that I know Steve Mulroy's office spends a lot of time working on. Well, typically that in and of itself is not going to be a federal crime. 
However, if somebody commits an assault with a gun and that somebody is a felon, well, that, that could be a federal crime. If you're a felon in possession of a firearm, firearms travel in interstate commerce, that could be a federal crime. We do a lot of those cases. Drug cases are probably the best example of something that, that is both a state and federal crime. There's not a complete overlap between the jurisdiction that we have in drug cases, but essentially every illegal drug case could be a state crime or could be federal. Another last thing I'll say is, you know, there's a lot of debate about juvenile justice and juvenile crime these days. To be frank, that's not something, that's not really a sandbox that we play in. Uh, the federal government is, is just not set up to prosecute juveniles. Um, I think that's a really hard area, so it's, it's fine with me that that's um, frankly not something that we're really equipped uh, to deal with because I think there are not a lot of easy answers. Uh, we also just, you know, we don't do misdemeanors. If you're in federal court, you know, it's probably going to be pretty serious. Um, that's just kind of lay of the land. Second thing I wanted to kind of cover were some of our priorities just to give you a sense of kind of what we're working on. And I'm using press releases. I'm not here to advertise or advocate for <laughs> what we're doing. I'm, I'm, I'm here just to tell you about what we do. Um, I don't run for this position, to be clear. Um, I'm not an elected official. Um, but the press releases are a good way for me to kind of illustrate this because we have to be pretty careful about what we do say publicly about our cases. And so we vet the press uh, release information pretty carefully. So this is obviously public, publicly available information. So um, that's why I've got some of these examples. But when people ask me, and they often do, what are your priorities? What are you working on? We start, I start often with gun violence. I mentioned it already a couple of times, gun violence, right? We are all thinking about gun violence every day. Um, I think many of us would agree uh, that it's affects, it affects our willingness to go get groceries or to go get gas. I mean, we've all read stories in the newspaper and heard about our friends and neighbors. Maybe you have been a victim of gun violence. It is on the you know top of our radar screen. Um, and I'll talk about how we come at that in a second. But one of the things I think about a lot um, is I'm a runner. Um, my wife, Anna, will tell you that wherever we travel, I, I like to go on a run, uh, put on my running shoes and just you know, check out where we are. And I think it should be a baseline public safety expectation that you can put on your running shoes and go on a run, no matter who you are, what time of day, what neighborhood you live in. And I think, obviously, we're not really meeting that baseline public safety expectation in Memphis or elsewhere in America right now. And it's not any one person or agency or official's fault, but it's it's a fail. It's a failing that right now we're not meeting that baseline public safety expectation. I didn't know Eliza Fletcher here in Memphis. Many of you may have. Um, I know many people in this church did. We knew about 15 people that did know her. Um, but whether you're Eliza Fletcher in Memphis or Ahmed Arbery in Georgia, if I remember who Ahmed Arbery was, who the young man who went on a run and was killed because he was black um, in Georgia. And whether you're Eliza Fletcher or Ahmed Arbery, you ought to be able to go on a run and not be in fear of being killed, right? So that's just kind of one of the ways I come at this very, very serious problem. Um, what do we do? Well, we, as I mentioned, we can prosecute uh, some robbery crimes, business robberies, carjackings, um, firearm cases, There's certainly a lot of firearm uh, statutes that we enforce. These are just a couple of examples uh, of some armed robberies. Um, this is a robbery. The second one is a robbery of a postal carrier, federal crime, right? That's a federal employee if you rob a federal employee. Uh, we have other tools that we can use. We, we use the RICO statute. You may think of RICO as like organized crime and the mafia. Yeah, we can use the RICO statute for violent street gangs, and we do that. Uh, we focus our efforts on the federal side with, you know, kind of the people who are actually the trigger pullers in gun violence, like you know, we could we could spend all of our time prosecuting felons in possession of a firearm. I can tell you that like we get more business than we're able to handle in that front, unfortunately. But we kind of have to focus our efforts on who's driving this violence. We try to keep up with emerging threats. Um, one that I'll highlight uh, under a recent unfortunate trend are switches. Anyone knows anyone here knows what a switch is? Okay, a switch, yeah, unfortunately, um, 
if you, you know, switches are essentially machine gun conversion devices. And so you can drop this little piece of polymer or plastic or whatever it is into a Glock semi-automatic firearm and it becomes a machine gun. There's a video we're not able to play it this morning. This was a recent announcement that I made. We're handling a lot of these cases because when you possess one of those switches or put it in a firearm, that, that's a federal crime. Um, it's, it's a machine gun and a machine gun is against federal law. Um, so uh, we had a recent press availability where we, we talked about this problem. We have a public service announcement. You're welcome, you can go to our website and you can look at the minute long public service announcement that I cut. And it's, it's mainly just to kind of show in that announcement, we show a, there's a trained ATF agent, you know, shooting one of these firearms with a switch and this trained ATF agent cannot control where these bullets are going. And Memphis police um, patrol officers will tell you that they used to come up on a shooting scene and there'd be a, a handful of shell casings on the ground and now they find 30 or 50. Um, dangerous, uh, it's a big problem. Uh, we're looking at the supply side of the gun violence problem. You know, that's what I call kind of, you know, uh, straw purchasing and gun trafficking and things like that. We could just talk about gun violence. I got other things I want to talk about, so I'll move on. Uh, last thing I'll say about it, though, is we do try to, we work on prevention and intervention to try to keep people from picking up these guns and dangerous weapons in the first place. This week, I'm going to speak with some juveniles who have been cited in juvenile court uh, for a firearm violation. And basically, I'm going to be there, and the mayor will be there, and Chief Davis and Steve Mulroy, and we're going to basically say, gosh, you're, you're, you're 15. You've got a couple of choices ahead of you in terms of the path. You know, we provide them with some services that they can take advantage of and basically try to urge them to put the guns down and stay away from uh, from those weapons. Anyway, we, we work on those things. Um, drug trafficking, as, as I mentioned, that's the PSA. You can look it up if you want. Uh, we work on drug trafficking cases every day. Um, unfortunately, Memphis is a distribution center, not just for legal goods and services, but for illegal goods, north, south, and east, west corridors. We see this every day. I used a couple of exam recent examples from our cases. I picked out the Greyhound bus um, case because that kind of illustrates in a very tangible way um, the, the, the way that drugs come into Memphis and, and through Memphis. Uh, that was a case where that Greyhound bus passenger had almost a kilogram of cocaine and a kilogram of fentanyl. Um, and you know, one of the things I started in the drug unit in our office, and I'll, I'll just kind of share with you, I think, an unfortunate truth, which I think my DEA partners would agree with, is we just scratched the surface in terms of what we're seizing and what we're finding and of the Ill illegal drugs that come through. We do a good job, I think, but we're just really scratching the surface. Um, we got, we have a fentanyl problem, methamphetamine, heroin, other, other lethal drugs. I would say fentanyl, uh, I said this recently, in 19 years I've been doing this, I think it's the worst thing that we've seen. I think it's the biggest challenge we have in um, illegal drug enforcement. And it's uh, one pill can kill. And if you have a young person in your life, high school, college, whatever, you should probably make sure that they have um, internalized that message that one pill can kill um, or middle-aged person or whoever. Um, it is one of these threats that I think crosses all sorts of socioeconomic um, lines and geographic lines. It's not just a inner city Memphis problem. It's a rural West Tennessee problem. It's everywhere. Um, okay, sorry, this is not supposed to be depressing. <laughs> uh, we're gonna talk, so we're gonna get, get to some other messages here in a second. Um, fraud and economic crimes. A lot of times you think of the federal government doing white collar cases. Yes, that's something we work on, right? Any, any crime involving the internet could be a federal crime. So there's a lot of crimes that are used with the internet. Um, so this is just a recent example of some businessmen that we prosecuted for defra defrauding a federal program. Um, I didn't, you know, again, not, not trying to be depressing, so I didn't, I don't have any examples of some of the child exploitation cases that we do, but that's a big part of our docket, unfortunately, all sorts of crimes against children. Um, and the last, uh, I guess, bucket of cases that I wanted to just highlight were national security and civil rights. Before um, the events of, in Memphis in January that I referenced earlier, I had actually asked my team, you know, how can we better protect national security and civil rights in Memphis and West Tennessee? Top priority of mine, it's a top priority of this administration and Merrick Garland. 
Um, I would say a related problem is, <clears throat> and I should say, well, so one way we do that is vigorous enforcement of civil rights statutes. This was a case from February of this year where a former Memphis police officer pled guilty to a federal civil rights crime because of uh, excessive use of force against a detainee and uh, that he had arrested. Um, that's the type of thing we work on. Uh, we, we take those violations seriously. A related problem is the rise in domestic terrorism and political violence in America. I think this is a big problem. Mayor Garland agrees. Um, but that's threats, that's violence against election workers, judges, law enforcement, um, elected officials. We're also seeing hate crimes, of course, as well. And, you know, um, unfortunately, there's kind of a litany of place names that we associate with these types of awful events. Uh, El Paso, Charleston, Charlottesville, Pittsburgh, Colorado Springs, Buffalo. Um, you know, I cross my fingers every day that there's not a place name in West Tennessee that will add itself to that list, at least ever, but certainly while I have this job. But look, it's a, these threats are real. The threat of violent and hate-based extremism is real. And our oath as assistant U.S. attorneys commands us to protect uh, the country from enemies, foreign and domestic. And so we do that. Um, I do want to talk about civil rights a little bit more because I did put that in the title of this presentation. Uh, um, just to kind of play that out a bit. Look, I mean, protecting civil rights is one of the three prongs of the Justice Department's mission. And if you've ever heard you can kind of look this up. Merrick Garland speaks about this all the time, and he speaks, in my humble, humble opinion, very compellingly about how this is in the department's DNA, the Department of Justice's DNA, to protect civil rights. The department was founded in 1870. Why? To protect the civil rights of African Americans in this area of the country, whose uh, rights were being trampled upon by people who were seeking to deny the promises of the 13th, 14th, 15th, 15th Amendments of, to the Constitution. Um, so, you know, I agree it's in our DNA. And so we pursue accountability for anyone who tramples on civil rights. Uh, what does that look like? I already said on criminal on the criminal side, we do handle cases involving law enforcement um, misconduct, excessive force, failure to intervene, sexual misconduct by people in uh, acting under the color of law. Um, we also handle hate crimes. I mentioned hate crimes, but hate crimes on the federal system essentially can be uh, acts or threats of violence motivated by bias based on certain characteristics. The statute sets out those characteristics. They're what you would expect, probably race, color, national origin, religion, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, or disability. So if you commit a crime motivated by bias based on one of those things, think um, Pittsburgh. I mentioned Pittsburgh, the attack on the synagogue in Pittsburgh. That's a federal trial, death penalty federal death penalty trial going on right now. Um, so uh, hate crimes or civil rights violations, human trafficking, something we work on on the federal side. And then there is kind of a civil side of civil rights enforcement, so not criminal violations where we're sending people to jail, but on the civil side, we work with the Civil Rights Division in Washington to enforce statutes like the Fair Housing Act, Americans with Disabilities Act, um, Voting Rights Act, Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, you may see the Civil Rights Division involved in reviews, investigations on the civil side of law enforcement agencies throughout the country. Um, I've allocated, you know, additional resources. You know, I could talk about this more to these areas of national security and civil rights. I'm actually going to have an announcement probably pretty soon just about how we're internally restructuring our office to better deal with these issues. That's that's just kind of my overview, and I didn't want to skip too much time talking about what we do, but I think it, I, I thought it could be helpful to give you a sense of what we work on every day. Uh, it's a, that's a non-exhaustive list. There are other things we work on, too. But my last kind of piece of this was to talk about how I approach the job of seeking justice, okay? Our mission, again, uphold the rule of law, protect civil rights, and keep people safe. Um, one of the key principles that underlies our work day to day is that there is one rule of law, okay? There is not one rule of law for rich people and another for poor. There is not one rule of law for people uh, who have power and another who don't, for, for people who don't. And there's certainly not one rule of law for people who look like us and another for people of color. 
uh, one rule of law, and in recent years, and in the last couple of weeks, you hear talk about the department or, you know, do we have a two-tiered system of justice? All I can tell you is that for me and my team in West Tennessee, we do not. We have one rule of law and we apply that equally uh, for all. Um, justice also, for me, um, is about putting more than putting people in prison. I'll talk more about how we administer our criminal laws in a second. For me, and I would say uh, for many people in, in uh, these roles, we think of justice more broadly. Um, justice is about who votes, right? And, and how hard it is to cast that vote. Justice, for me, is about where pipelines go. I think that's a justice issue. I think where bus routes go, public transportation is a justice issue. Um, whether women have access to health care, I think that's been in the news this weekend whether citizens have affordable housing or clean drinking water. To me, those are justice issues too. Sometimes they're actually Department of Justice issues. Sometimes they're not, but for me, they're all justice issues. Um, and I guess, you know, if I hear somebody talking about justice or even the justice system and all they talk about is putting people in prison, I, I wonder whether they're really thinking of justice um, in the right way. Um, that being said, most of the tools I, I and my team have available to us are criminal enforcement tools, right? And so we seek just punishment for people who break the law. We do this every day. We make decisions based on the law and the facts. Uh, we treat people equally and fairly, like I said. Um, and the number of prosecutions is not the be all end all. That's not what I uh, stress to my staff. What I stress to my staff is making the community safer, right? Um, all of that is kind of easy to say. So what does it look like in practice? I guess one of the things I would share or, or suggest to you is that it's not easy to make these calls, okay? Um, and I'll say more about that in a second. But since this is a Sunday school adult forum, as we're in church and it's an adult forum, I did find some scripture to share, to kind of frame the thinking on these, on these issues. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I'm someone who gets a little suspicious or skeptical when a public official starts spouting off, you know, Bible verses. Um, that being said, I, I, I'm not a biblical scholar by any stretch, uh, but I thought I would provide a few examples of how the Bible addresses matters of justice. Um, here, and, I, and I'm going to kind of have, have them grouped in two groups. First, how the Bible addresses accountability, and then how the Bible addresses um, redemption and mercy. So first, accountability. Just a few examples. In Genesis, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. So murderer should be punished, right? Likewise, in Leviticus, you know this principle that when a man causes a disfigurement, uh, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, right? He shall be disfigured in the same way. That's not what our 2023 justice system looks like precisely, and that's a good thing, right? But that's a basic principle that under, of retribution, right, that underlies how we approach justice and criminal justice in particular. Here's one for referencing people and positions of authority. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Those who resist will incur judgment. So, I understand from my extensive Googling, and it goes on and says, you know, uh, that, you know, if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not, he, the, the, the bearer of authority, does not bear the sword in vain. He is the servant of God to execute his wrath, wrath on the wrongdoer. I understand from my Googling that this can be a fairly controversial pack, uh, uh, passage uh, for theologians, um, and you can understand why, like, well, what if the government or the person in power is himself or herself corrupt, right, and unjust, right? Do I need to obey an unjust law or a uh, person in authority? And to be clear, I don't consider myself the servant of God to execute my wrath. It's not, it's not what we do. Um, but I, I, do, I do think it's at least interesting how the Bible, you know, um, it speaks of accountability. And it's certainly a principle that, 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 that is uh, wrestled with in Scripture. On the other side, or the other pole, there's obviously many passages in the Bible that emphasize the power of redemption, of mercy, of forgiveness. 
I did not plan this, but you guys were all wearing your shirts with one of these, <laughs> with one of these verses on the back, uh, which I think is maybe uh, the best example of kind of how the Bible expresses the, the notion of acting justly, loving mercy, walk humbly with your God. That's from Micah. Uh, similarly, in Isaiah, I found this passage from Psalm because I know we're talking about Psalms uh, this, this month in church. He loves righteousness and justice. <clears throat> so obviously the Bible has all sorts of uh, passages that touch on these, these themes. This is the writer of Lamentations saying, I called on thy name from the depths of the pit, thou didst hear my plea. The writer of this passage is pleading for help, and, and the Lord responds with compassion. Um, to me, it's not hard to see the gist kind of of that passage reflected in our criminal justice system, really in the person of, um, or in the form of those who are appointed to represent criminal defendants in our system. I think it's terrific that we have a criminal justice system that provides people who are accused with a crime with an advocate, a defender. We have at least one, if not more, de public defenders in, at Idlewild. Um, and you know these are people we work with in my office every day. Um, they do a terrific job. Um, I was going to share that Brian Stevenson, anybody knows who Brian Stevenson is? Some of you I'm sure do. Criminal uh, defense attorney and social justice activist. He wrote the book Just Mercy, which became a movie. Um, he also founded the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, um, which is committed to ending excessive punishment, challenging racial and economic injustice, and protecting human rights. Um, but the way he's described his phrase, just mercy, uh, Mr. Stevenson has said, that phrase expresses my observation that our criminal justice system has become deficient with regard to compassion and mercy. We have mandatory sentencing laws that are extreme and harsh. We don't put crimes in prison. We put people in prison and people are always more than just their crimes. And he's probably best known for that uh, principle that each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. Um, I agree, I'm your head federal prosecutor in Memphis, and I should tell you, I agree with essentially all of that. Um, I agree that the criminal justice system is not necessarily structured to put compassion or mercy at the forefront, just the way it works. That's just not how it works. There is room for those principles to enter into the process, but it's not really structured to put, to put them at the forefront. I also agree that mandatory sentencing laws, something I use every day, um, can be harsh and can be can lead to extreme results and sometimes results that affect certain communities disproportionately. I also agree that every person is more than the worst thing they have, they've ever done, right? Um, I guess I would next say, however, and right, I inhabit the other side of the line in my day-to-day -day work as a federal prosecutor. Um, and there is another side of, of the line that people sometimes deserve severe punishment for the worst thing that they've done. Um, we don't apologize for seeking su significant punishment where it's warranted. If you break the rules, you know, you need to face consequences. And sometimes in our view, and to be clear, I don't make the decision on sentences, that's a judge. I'm glad that it's someone else making the decision, but, but we do obviously play a role in this. And sometimes in our view, the right consequence is a long prison sentence. Uh, we don't care who you are, back to the notion that there's only one rule of law. We don't care if you're someone uh, who wears a badge or in a boardroom or on a street corner. If you break federal law, you know, we come after you. Um, but so those are, you know, some of the two principles that come into play in our work, mercy and punishment, redemption and accountability. I guess my, if there's nothing else I want to leave you with is these are, these are hard decisions. I, like they're really hard decisions. And if you're doing this job right, and I've told my prosecutors this, if you're doing your job right, it's hard. It should be hard to sort all of that out and decide on what the best answer is in any particular case. Um, if someone tells you that a prosecutor's job is easy or a judge's job for that matter, um, that all, all you have to do is kind of seek the maximum potential prison sentence or penalty in every case, I would humbly suggest they are wrong. Um, our job is to seek justice and do what's right. So to illustrate this further, and I, you know, I do want to give you guys a chance to ask any questions, but I thought I'd have uh, two scenarios that I'd lay out and see how you respond. Um, and these are just 
very real examples of the decisions that we make. Uh, and I hope to illustrate that they can be hard. I don't know, maybe they're easy for you. Um, where, where decisions can be difficult in our work, um, certainly whether to chart. Let me, let me frame that notion first by saying if we don't, for, for us, it really doesn't come into play, oh, do we think they're guilty or not? If we think someone, if we, if we don't think someone's guilty, we don't, we stop there, right, to be clear. Um, and, um, or if we think they're guilty, but we can't prove it, we stop there. Um, the, the, the real tough decisions are, well, even if we think they're guilty and we can prove it, should we actually bring the case? If we bring the case, what does that look like? What types of penalties do we bring to the table? Once we secure a conviction, whether somebody pleads guilty or is convicted at trial, what type of sentence do we argue for? And even to back that up, once we're negotiating a plea, what type of, you know, how, how, um, what type of things do we negotiate for in a plea deal? Okay, so two examples. What first example? Real example. Um, recently, six months ago, we charged somebody uh, with selling a few of those switches. Remember the switches I was telling you about with the machine guns? So this defendant worked at a gun store, actually. Um, and on the side, I don't know how he got these switches, but he was selling these switches. First time he did it, he sold a couple of them. And then he sold them a few weeks later, he sold a couple more. And then he set up another deal to sell 20 of these switches uh, about a month later. Unfortunately, he was selling them to an undercover ATF agent. That's a problem. Um, so, okay, we charged him. We charged him with selling these switches. Let me tell you a few more facts about this person. No criminal history, never been arrested before, ever. Worked at a gun store, which by the way, if you've never, you know, you may not patronize gun stores, but they're legal, they're businesses, just like every other business. He worked there, he actually had another job. He was helping his mother pay her bills down in South Haven. He took his three and four year old kids to preschool every day so that his mother, who he was not with anymore, could go to her job and make money. And the defense attorney, uh, it was actually David Bell was one of the public defenders I was uh, referencing earlier. I don't think it was David's case, but it was one of his colleagues in his case in his office came to me, to us, but really to me ultimately and said, we think you should drop the case. And there's a diversion uh, alternative that we have. Diversion was in the news this week. If you read about Hunter Biden's plea deal, not going to talk about that. But but I, you you may remember that if you read about Hunter Biden's plea deal, um, diversion is a tool that we have where we you know we charge someone and then because we learn some things about the case or the defendant in question, we have the alternative to essentially say, okay, we'll put you on a probation type situation. If you're good for two years, you don't get any more trouble. We'll drop the case and it'll, it's like it never happened. They asked for diversion in this case um, and presented all of those facts that I the mitigating facts that I just. Uh, shared with you. Um, honor student in high school, I left that out. Stellar recommendations from his two employers, had two jobs. Um, and if he becomes a, you know, a felon, he loses his job. And of course, it's hard to get a job if you're a felon these days. Uh -huh. What would you do? <laughs> the question is, would you give diversion to this defendant? Yeah, yes. Why, Mackie? Mercy. Yeah. Yeah, look, one of the reasons we bring any case is deterrence, not just for that particular person, but general deterrence and to send the message that this is not something that's good. Sure. Absolutely. Great question. Yes, that enters into our thinking in every type of this case. You know where it also enters into our thinking is drug cases, right? We get somebody with drugs. We want to figure out where they got them, right? Same with switches. Absolutely right. He'd been working there. Good question. I think a couple of years. Again, stellar recommendation from his employer. Uh, 
Uh, so, so for you, it would matter whether those switches were actually used in some violent crime or in some part of it. These are all, they're all really good questions. Is there anybody who gravitates towards denying diversion in that case? This is out of wild, so maybe not. I deny diversion. We deny diversion. And I told Doris Holt, federal public defender, who I've worked with for 19 years, I said, look, this is kind of bad timing because this switch thing is like front and center for us right now. Big deal for us. And like, we think it's a big problem. I'm convinced it's a big problem. And sending the message was important. Now, I often ask Mackie, when we issue a press release or whatever, is anybody really reading these? Like, I mean, is is it's not like the guys on the street corner, oh, look at the press release that Kevin sent out. Like, we better not sell any more of these switches or whatever. Uh, but just uh, for consistency's sake and, you know, I mean, the other reasons that, you know, we, we kind of put on the table, again, the repeated nature of the conduct. He did it several times. He had 20 that he was bringing to sell on the last time. We said no, uh, but I, I think it's a hard call. It was hard, but that's the decision that we reached. Maybe you don't think it's hard, and that's that's fair. Uh, for me, it was. Um, another scenario: um, drug conspiracy case. I mentioned drugs just a second ago, um, and this you touched on this. Basically, if you have a drug conspiracy, we see you know sometimes there's 15 people involved in in bringing fentanyl to Memphis, and you've got people like at the top of the organization that are the kingpins that are talking to the people in Mexico or wherever they're getting it. Then you got people who are maybe like violent enforcers that aren't really actually taking the drugs from place A to place B, but they're, you know, kind of providing security. You got money launderers sometimes in drug conspiracies. And I don't know, you know, that I, I'm kind of describing maybe people in with from greater culpability levels to lesser, right? And then we see this every day in our drug cases. You've got the mules, to kind of touch on what you were just asking about. You've got people who are taking the drugs. I gave you that example of somebody taking the drugs and arriving at the Greyhound bus station in Memphis. Um, a lot of times those individuals don't have a criminal history and never been arrested. Um, they may not know how many drugs they have. It's obviously very intentional not to tell people sometimes. We just want you to take this package and from place A to place B, we're going to give you $6,000 to do it. So, you know, obviously it's not going through FedEx. You could, why couldn't you just, you know, again, I'm not really worried about guilt here, but I'm worried about culpability and what we do with the case. Um, they may not know what type of drugs. They may not know if it's marijuana or cocaine or fentanyl. Um, what would you do? <laughs> so let's say it was a case with 5,000 pills of fentanyl, which I think is what this gentleman at the, on the uh, Greyhound bus had. No criminal history. Would you, I guess, first question, would you charge him with a, with a crime at all? Got some yeses. Right. Okay. So then that's, yeah, we agree. Um, the next question is, what does that look like? I can tell you that on back to the mandatory sentencing regime that we have, on the federal side, 5,000 pills of fentanyl triggers, don't, I think about a 10 year mandatory minimum sentence in prison, 10 years minimum. So judge has no discretion to go under 10 years. Would you bring that particular charge? Yes, but like, where's the leverage, right? Do you have to bring the charge first? Yes, we can and we do that every day. <laughs> what happens if you bring the charge with that in mind so that to be clear, the principle is you bring the charge, to try to leverage, basically you want this person to flip and tell you where they got the drugs or tell you who told them to, to bring them from A, A to B and they don't do it. What if they don't, they don't flip because they're scared or whatever? Then we're stuck, I can tell you, because we don't just turn around and drop a charge, like, right? I've been in this position when I handle drug cases. It's like, I was absolutely certain this female who brought, I think it was nine kilograms of cocaine to Memphis, 
we charge her with this, you know, pretty very serious crime, no history, single mother. She was going to flip. Well, guess what? She didn't because I think she thought her family was going to get killed in Mexico. And she went to prison. She just pled guilty. She took it and she went to prison for 10 years. I don't know. Any other thoughts? Creative solutions? You want to tell me how we can do our do these things? Jake? You gotta go to church. Okay. Sure. Every case is a little different, no doubt. That that type of framework is something we do deal with every day. Bottom line, it can be hard. It's hard to apply these principles of you know mercy and redemption on one hand accountability and justice on the other i'm sorry am i running over it's about time any other okay it's about time i'm here you can come up and ask me a question afterwards thank you for your time thanks for inviting me there's no sunday school next week because it's fourth of july the next Sunday school is in two weeks. Joshua Narcissus will talk about the black church and the mystic tradition. Thanks, everybody.